Hi Cam followers, it says me here and I'm interviewing the lovely Samantha Lindley today. Um, she is one of my big um, inspirations in what I do. Uh, so Sam, I hope you don't mind me putting you on the spot, but I'm gonna do something we call 10 top tips. This is general tips for um, pets in how to manage their pain. So I'll go first. So um, number 10, try to manage your pet's weight. So we offer a free body condition scoring service on CAM, but that's something really important to work out how um, overweight your pet may or may not be. And that's something you can do with your vet and then accordingly feed them, do the exercise, all the things they may need to try and keep them in that perfect body condition score. Number nine from Sam. The line from Sam, be sensible about exercise. We all love to exercise our dogs and we love to see them running about. Think about the surfaces that they're running on. Um, and one of my pet hates, I'm sorry if it's going to upset anybody, but there we go, is to see people running with their dogs attached to them on concrete. Um, that they, they can't regulate their own, get, their own gait and their pace. And you're getting a very constant frequent concussion on the same joints and that isn't good for them so if you want to run with them run on grass and where it's safe to do so which of course we're not supposed to be doing at the moment have them off lead or have them on a long lead as long as you're not causing a danger to anyone else so they can regulate their pace and so that they're not pounding around on a hard surface absolutely um, my number eight is to think about buying some really fun toys for them to play with at home that aren't high impact. So the Kongs, the Licky Mats, um, Snuffle Mats, um, lots of adventure type activity games. They're really great for dogs. They're good for releasing endorphins. They're good for keeping them busy. And it's a nice way to give them food and treats and splitting their meals through the day. Number seven. Number seven, so I'm really the... I'm really the fun police, aren't I? So on that basis, um, ball checkers. Oh, um, ball checkers, yeah, they look great fun. And I think they're, they're all right with you sensibly. One of the problems is that they create a brilliant bounce. And these dogs that jump up and grab the, the ball on the bounce, whether it's thrown from a chucker or not, if you watch what they do, they twist their spine from the bottom of their chest and the, the lower back. And that impacts a, a short muscle that runs between the bottom of the chest and the pelvis, and it's the, what we call the sublumbar muscles. And they can become very painful. And you, you just watch next time a dog does that, they leap, they twist, and then they crash to the ground. And when they do that repetitively, they're not only putting repetitive impact on their joints, think about footballers, um, but they're also straining their muscles. And of course they'll carry on doing it because they're having fun. So be sensible about ball throw, use hide and seek games. Um, if the dog's already got arthritis or small amounts of rolling, um, some dogs are just happy to carry a ball around and then every so often do a small amount of throw, throwing. So be sensible about it. We tend to give our dogs a lot of driven exercise rather than allowing them to do their own thing where it's safe to do so. Yeah, absolutely. My number six is um, to look out for subtle changes. So it can be something as simple as your dog's not sleeping in the same position as it always has done, or um, they used to follow you around the house and they don't do that anymore. They might not be limping, but any change in subtle behavior could be a sign of pain. And that's a point where I would be thinking we need to talk to the vet. Number five. Number five, think about how they get in and out of the car. So. Um, in, with the beauty of hindsight, we would train all our puppies, and those of you who've got puppies, train them now to use steps or ramps to get in and out of the car. It is such a pain to try to train them when they're older. Many dogs see a ramp as an obstacle, and I'm sure many people listening will have had this experience. They see it as an obstacle, they try to jump past it, they crash into it, and then they're never going to look at it again. If we train them as puppies to use a step or a box or a ramp, it doesn't have to be a ramp, um, and that's how they get it in and out of the car. Not only will it make life easier as they get older, and you can hope all you like that your animal's not gonna have arthritis, but you can't know, um, and many, many dogs do, so you might as well assume they're going to. But also the very fact of trying to jump in and jumping out, all that impact on the elbows and the shoulders and the neck as they try and stabilize, as they jump out of the car, that repeated concussion is actually leading them to develop arthritis as well. So if you look at the way they get in and out of the car, 
And even if it means getting in the side of the car, as long as they're well restrained rather than in the boot, then so much the better. Yeah, absolutely. So my number four is um, thinking about when you've got an older pet who needs grooming, try and find yourself an understanding groomer. Because one of my pet hates is when I've had a patient really stable and then they've gone to the groomer and they've had a two hour session where they've been made to stand still to look perfect. I would prefer your, your dog to look shaggy and be comfortable than have stood for two hours and look uh, show ready. So I think it's important to work with your groomer and to, if you can, split sessions or um, make sure they're nicely analgy, so lots of pain relief on board before. And that's something you can either speak to your vet about if you think you need a little top up before or um, um, work really well with your groomer to make sure you're not forcing your dog into an uncomfortable position for a long period of time because that's a real pet hate of mine um yeah so number three number three going on um continue the theme of the older animal beware the making your own diagnosis of your dog becoming senile we're all aware of cognitive dysfunction in, in ourselves and, and uh, well, ourselves, yes, I speak for myself, um, uh, our, our relatives and, and horrible, sad condition. Yeah. And it does occur, we know that it occurs in our dogs, but it is very much what we call a diagnosis of default. In other words, when you have ruled out everything else causing the problem, you may think about the fact that it's cognitive dysfunction. The key word here is cognitive. Can they still think? If they can still respond to your commands and do everything normal in all sorts of ways, but they happen just to be up and about pacing around at night, it's probably not cognitive dysfunction. Yeah. Many animals will display signs of what would be regarded as cognitive dysfunction, particularly vocalizing at night, pacing at night, shuffling about, not wanting to be on their own, um, getting trapped behind things because they're painful. Yes. If, if you can't, if you get behind a door and you can't turn around because your spine's too sore, then people sometimes interpret that as, oh, they've just got stuck in a position and they don't know what to do about it. And we tend to feel pain more at night when everything's quiet, when you're trying to sleep, when there's no other stimuli, maybe when you're away from your owners, which you've coped with fine for 10 years, but now you can't cope with it because pain is frightening and you want to have company and you want to have that reassurance and you just can't get to sleep and so you pace around a lot and then you get diagnosed with cognitive dysfunction so do be aware that that kind of change of sign may well be about pain uh, rather than about cognitive dysfunction so get some help for it rather than assuming that it's just your dog getting old yeah i think that's um i'm a bit controversial because i think there's so so many dogs that are overdiagnosed with this uh, behavioral dysfunction and um I would say, I mean, this is just a ballpark figure, but probably 90% of the dogs that come with behaviours, to me, that come for a pain clinic and have been diagnosed with arthritis and have started on acupuncture, 90% of the things that they were struggling with improve because it wasn't to do with cognitive behavioural dysfunction in the first place. It was a pain behaviour. So you've absolutely hit the nail on the head there with that one. Um, my number two would be um, feeding stations. Um, I think that's... A, Often our kitchens are tiled or slippery floors, so we've kind of touched on that already. And having a, um, uh, uh, like the little cheap doormats you can get or some kind of mat around your feeding station is important because often, especially with the larger dogs, they're leaning down, their legs are splaying, and that's a real point where they can start to get painful. Um, but I think a raised feeding bowl to the right level can be really, really useful. It's something I'd seek guidance about rather than just buying if you're not sure. And I often like to buy just use a shoe box or something and test things out first before I spend a lot of money on something. Um, but I think that's a really useful, useful thing. There's some conditions where it's not appropriate to have a raised feed bowl, but um, in general, it can be really, really helpful. So um, I would reassess where and how you're feeding your pet. And water bowls as well. I'd be yes. very aware of the water stations, particularly if your animal is older and it's on non-steroidals, you want it to drink plenty. And if it's a long walk and it's hard work, they're not going to do it. And your number one? Um, weather. We're coming up to the spring. So many animals do well in the sun uh, with their arthritis, just as people do. Some do worse. So don't assume that the sun is always good and warmth is always good. Uh, and many animals in pain suffer with the heat more. They become hotter, has effects on the hypothalamus, which is the air in the brain that, uh, that controls temperature. 
And so look at what your pet is doing. Are they lying on hard surfaces, odd surfaces, because there's a cool draft? Get down there, get down into that surface and see what is that area, is it cool? And if it is cool, well, that's fine. But if you find that because they've been on that hard surface, they then have trouble getting up or they're really stiff because they've been lying on a hard surface, then you need to find other ways of helping them cool down. There are cool mats, although not all dogs like them. Um, you can cool the animal with a, with a damp towel and then use a fan, which helps the, the water to evaporate, which helps them cool. Maybe move their bed to an area that there's a, a draft. Think about the features of where they sleep are they trying to be warm? Are they trying to be cool? And use that to guide you in terms of temperature. We all hate having you know, the wrong temperature um, just generally, but in terms of the effect on uh, your pain, it can be quite profound. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a brilliant one.